Okay, boys and girls. Sorry for all the any possible technical malfunction we've had going into tonight's broadcast, which is being done on short notice. Once again, this is Prehistory, a Traveler's Guide. I am your host, Greg Natterman, and with me today, I just have Scott Martis, Sam Eiler, and for our uh, guest tonight, we are doing something a little different than usual. We're taking a kind of a break from the paleontology stuff and focusing more on the entertainment and pop culture side of things. This is part, this is going to be part one of a two-part special, a bigger special that we're going to be hosting in about two weeks from now with special guest <laughs> Alan Davis. then. But for tonight, we are having on author and editor of Prehistoric Magazine, Micah Sola. Welcome to the show, Mike. Thank you, guys. Thank you. So as we always do with any new guests we bring on to the show, want to give us and our audience, respectively, a little background on yourself, Mike, and how you got involved in the pre- in editing a magazine and writing uh, creature fiction. Sure. Um, yeah, I mean, I, I guess my writing career started about 10 years ago. Um, I've, I've been plugging away for a little bit of time now. And, uh, you know, I'm just a person like yourselves, probably into dinosaurs when I was a kid and other things of prehistory. And, you know, kind of that fascination never went away. Um, I started writing, excuse me, screenplays with a buddy of mine and we started pitching them. And, you know, as you can assume, it's a tough road to get someone interested in something like that. So what I did is I took my first screenplay and I turned it into my first book, which was just the ice gorilla. And pretty much ever since then, I've just been off to the races writing. And about about three or four years ago, I, I decided, you know what, I'm going to try and start just a little online magazine for all the authors that I've kept in touch with over the years as a way to, you know, kind of promote their work to a, a, a target niche of people. Um, so that's pretty much how the magazine has started. You know, it's still small at this point. We've been looking into getting a physical edition out. We, we haven't actually been able to do that yet. Uh, it's still just currently online. So I, I do that, and, and, I, and I write, I guess, what, what I like to call prehistoric thrillers, uh, creature books. So I guess I guess that's pretty much myself in a, in a minute or two. Yeah, that, that's, that's a good way to, that's a good, good occupation to have. You know, writing creature creature fiction. That's some of my favorite books to read are books featuring dinosaurs and other prehistoric animals. Myself, too. Myself, too. Yeah. I've read a lot from the Michael Crichton's Jurassic Park, Steve Alton's Meg series, and so much else in between. Mm-hmm. So, so the topics we'll be discussing tonight will be movies like the upcoming Meg film. We'll be discussing that later on in the show. So, yeah. What was your creative spark or inspiration for your first book, The Ice Gorilla? Um... That's actually a good question. I, I in, in college, I, I majored in environmental studies, and I and I I did a lot of research on you know ice shells breaking off, and that type of thing. And um, I guess as I got a little older, I always thought I wanted to center a story around researchers out in the middle of the Arctic, and all of a sudden, an ice shelf that they were on breaks away from the mainland, and and I kind of hypothesized what would happen if these people were trapped on this floating island of ice. And that was originally the that was originally the screenplay idea that we had. And when my friend and I sent it out for coverage to the agents, they said that, you know, no the general public is not going to understand what an ice shelf is. So you have to come up with some something, something that's brandable. And that's when I kind of envisioned that, well, what if there was creatures out there? And you know, basically I came up with uh, the, the title The Ice Gorilla. And it was, you know, mind you, this is seven years ago, so my, my research wasn't too in-depth. And I just kind of hypothesized that years ago, uh, on an ancient land bridge, uh, silverback gorillas from Africa migrated over. And over time, they kind of evolved into, into what they currently were. Um, but, I mean, I guess, I guess that just molds from my studying that in college, environmental science. And, you know, the actual term, the ice gorilla, just is me just trying to come up with something that's brandable, whereas, you know, someone hears that title and, and they instantly understand, you know, kind of what the, what the book or what the, what the genre is all about. Did you, did you bring any Yeti mythology into this? Um, I did not, per se. Uh, I mean, pretty much it was just, the book actually was written from a screenplay. Originally we wrote a 120-page screenplay, and... You know, screenplays are very thin, 
you know, they don't have much background. It's pretty much just all kind of fluff. And, you know, each page is important. He, he, you know, one page of a screenplay is one page up, up, up in a movie. <clears throat> so there's not a lot of time to tell, to tell backstory. Um, and when I went to write the book, the screenplay was my outline for the book. So if I had to do it over again, I probably would flesh things out and add more detail on that end. But, um, yeah, I mean, basically I wrote the entire book with the outline. With the screenplay served as my outline to, to, to finish the novel. Yeah, that's a very interesting little insight. And is there anything you might want to share with us about your other two books, uh, Prehistoric and uh, Hybrid? How they came uh, about? Yeah, I mean, I mean, I hope, I hope for anyone that's read them or would be interested in reading them, you know, you know, I hope I've, I've improved a lot. Um, you know, it's definitely been something that I've plugged away at for quite a long time. I've, I've taken the beating on Amazon. You know, it's always, it's always, it's always fun to go on Amazon and uh, see yourself get torn a new one, but. Uh, Hopefully, over time, I've read enough of those bad comments in order to take all the all the bad stuff and hopefully, you know, turn that into my new books. Um, my the, the book I wrote a few years ago was called Prehistoric, and that was basically based off of a a business idea I once had. I said, you know, what if someone built this giant um, platform up on top of a rainforest, and what if guests visited? you know, this, this giant walkway where you could walk many miles at the very top of the rainforest. And <clears throat> that idea never left me. And one day I was just thinking, you know, I'm going gonna, I'm, I'm gonna to do this as a book, but I need to come up with some type of creature. So, you know, I built this creature based off of various animals throughout prehistory, and I kind of went to town on it. And, you know, once again, at the time, it probably wasn't up to par. Uh, it's turned out to be my biggest selling book. I got, I got some lucky breaks along the way. Um, I, I, I happen to be listed as the number one recommended book next to James Patterson's Zoo. And when, when that book was made into a, a miniseries on TV, um, I sold thousands of books. And literally, you know, within the course of June and July of 2015, I, I sold four or 5,000 books just based off of the fact that I got linked on Amazon to the zoo. Um, and then ever since then, I've... I've dedicated myself to prehistoric magazine because I thought, you know, I, I need to have a more solid way to sell books. I can't, I can't always bank on getting a lucky break like that. So that's kind of where prehistoric magazine came in. And uh, my most recent book, Hybrid, is just the follow-up. And um, my, my main character, is, uh, his name is Bick Downs in prehistoric, and Hybrid is just the follow-up to that. And it's, uh, I'm, I'm working on book three in that. And, and you know, I'm hoping to be working on this book series for many years to come, as long as there are people to read it, and uh, hopefully I can find those readers. Um, you know, it's really just a matter of coming up with the next type of creature concept. Uh, that's, a, that's a fun thing about paleo fiction. You don't, you're not really limited. You have a whole menagerie of prehistoric animals to work with. And Correct. You can, always, you can always come up with your own monsters if need be. Correct. And and, and, and that's actually what I've been doing. That, that, that was actually what I did in my prehistoric book, was I kind of just came up with my own monster. It wasn't an actual creature. In fact, I never even called it a dinosaur. I just said that it was something that had persisted since the time of the dinosaurs. But uh, but a, a lot of people on Amazon have called it a dinosaur. So I never intended it to be a dinosaur, but a lot of people have considered it to be a dinosaur book, even though I didn't intend it to be that when I when I kind of first started writing the, uh, the original concept for it. That's pretty, pretty interesting. And now, okay, I've got the first question I'm going to pull up from the comment section was one of Sam's. Is like, how influential do you think prehistoric animals have been in designing, you know, giant monsters and kaiju and other things like that? Is that question for me or is that... Is that, that, was a que that was a question. That was one of the questions we were putting in for today's show. And we're going to carry those over to the big special two weeks' okay. time. Um, yeah, I mean, I, mean I, I think all the creatures are based off of some type of prehistory in general. Um, you know, obviously none of us have ever seen a dinosaur, certainly none of us have ever seen a kaiju with that, that in mind, but uh, I, I would wager to say that most people, I mean definitely myself, when I look at these animals, I always try and think back, you know, what what would have resembled that, but you know, when, when you're dealing with Godzilla and, and they're talking about it being 300 meters tall or something like that, you know, you know it's, hard to, it's hard to think of a comparison <laughs> to animal, but um, 
Yeah, I mean, I, I would like to think that all of kaiju fiction in general has to be based off of some type of interest in prehistory. Um, I, I kind of think that the uh, two, you know, kind of go hand in hand together. Yeah, that's definitely the case. A lot of kaiju definitely are inspired by the actual dinosaurs or something yeah. like that or another. Especially from Ray Harry Eisen to Toho Studios. And well, look at Onward look at Gorosaurus and Angiras. You know, those are obviously patterned after dinosaurs. Sure, sure. Yeah. Yep. Dinosaur mutations and uh, Kaiju Arthur Matt Danian's Atomic Rex is a nuclear is a nuclear powered Tyrannosaurus Rex. Nice. Just for another reference of a dinosaurian kaiju. Nice, nice. <laughs> so yeah, the prehistoric past has dredged up a lot of kaiju out there. I, I don't know if this is uh, something to verify, but I, I don't know if you guys follow, but there, uh, there's also another author by the name of Jeremy Robinson. Oh, yeah, I know who he is. Yeah. And he, the, pro- the author of Project Nemesis. Yeah, and, and he, I mean, I'm, I'm going to give him the benefit. He, he claims to be the, the creator of that kaiju thriller term, so um, at least that's what he claims. Um, I At the time, about five, six years ago, when I first discovered that book, I don't think I saw any type of fiction on the lines of that, so... I guess that's just an interesting tidbit that he, you know, he, he's obviously been pumping out a lot of creature fiction, but I, I think he was also thinking of how he would market it and, you know, coming up with that term, you know, that term kaiju real, has a real strong branding, especially in Asia. Yes, it does. Uh, yep. You know, I, 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 I think it was a pretty genius way to, to brand his books because a lot of them say a kaiju thriller, and now there's all sorts of other books that, you know, say... Uh, Beneath the title, they'll you know they'll, they'll they'll have the little title that'll say a kaiju thriller. Yeah, there's all and there's been a boom of kaiju fiction since Project Nemesis came out. Definitely, definitely. You have lots of authors, you know Zach Cole, Chris Martinez. It's just a handful. I've read lots of works of kaiju fiction from many other authors, including all of Matt Denyon's books. Definitely, definitely. And he just pumped out another Atomic Rex novel called Conquest of Chimera, which crosses over Atomic Rex with his first book, Chimera: Scourge of the Gods. Nice, nice. Okay, if you want to. Take a take a break from that. All right, Sam, you want to ask your question about how paleont how about uh, fossils may have influenced stories of dragons and other monsters in mythology? Yeah, uh, some paleontologists believe that uh, that, uh, that a lot of these stories about dragons and other monsters may have been influenced by ancient people coming across fossils. I was uh, I was curious as to what your views are on that, and uh, if if you agree with that, would you consider that a very a very ancient form of paleo fiction? Yeah, I, I mean definitely. I mean when you you know when you go back in the past um, and they were digging up bones, you know they didn't obviously know what to call it or consider it, but um, yeah, bones like that have been discovered for a long time, and you can go back through many civilizations and they all have their stories of enormous, you know, fire breathing animals and reptiles and lizards. Um, an, an interesting book for you guys is um, called the great zoo of China, which is by Matthew Riley. And that is about the, it's basically Jurassic meets dragons. And it's actually a really big concept. Um, you know, a lot of times when I watch movies, I'm always disappointed that Hollywood doesn't take a run at something like that because, um, <laughs> You know, that, you know, that that concept in general is basically off the fact that, you know, for years dragons have been in hiding and they've been hidden by the Chinese for, you know, 50 or 60 odd years. It's amazing soon. So um, I definitely think that cultures such as the Chinese and Asia, um, there's definitely a big interest in that. And I guess, I guess the answer to that is whether or not people realize it stems from the real truth, they may they may be unaware that their interest in these things stem from real things in the past. It just may be that they're just not up to date on it or they haven't read enough about it. Um, you know, because my wife, you know, she's learning all this stuff that I've been doing for years and this stuff is not common knowledge to most people. Um, you know, most people don't read up on this and, you know, most people know a dragon, but they wouldn't know any type of prehistoric animal in the past that they have been uh, confused with that. I, I, I hope that answers that in a long-winded answer. Huh. It's not just it's not just with the dragon. The other creatures like Cy- like the Cyclops and the Griffin, they've had they've found explanations for how they could have come about. 
the skulls of the skulls of ancient elephants. The opening of the skull where the trunk emerges from. Ancient peoples may have interpreted that as people who are not familiar with elephants may have interpreted that as being the skull of a cyclops. True, true. Or a, a dinosaur like Protoceratops or some other animals might have been the basis for creatures like the griffin and so forth. True, true. And there's also there's also a more psychological component to the form to the overall appearance and design of a dragon. Mm-hmm. So much deeper psychological underpinnings from ancient times, back when humans, back when Australopiths were around and so forth. They had to come up with all these different alarm calls for things like snakes, birds of prey, and big cats, and crocodiles. And sure, so sure. One, one thought, one theory I, I heard, one hypothesis I heard, was that over time, these three different creatures became and merged together into something that was an embodiment of a, concept, a conceptualization of all three as one monster. Mm-hmm. That's just simplifying things. Mm-hmm. That was from the book Deadly Powers. That's the title of the book I was referencing. Who, who's the author of that, Deadly Powers? I think the author's name was Paul Trout. Hmm. Okay. That's a very fascinating read into the psychology of mythology and our fear of our predators and whatnot. Mm-hmm. So. And it does mention, it does talk about dinosaurs, that's why I'm bringing it up here a little bit. <laughs> All right. Okay, Sam, we want to pluck another random question out of the hat here real quick? <laughs> uh, yeah, hang on. Uh, so, sorry, can you post the questions for me? I forgot to do that. I... Okay, the, all right, this one's kind of right. I'll read it off here. It says, how important do you think paleofiction is to uh, paleontology and getting people interested in dinosaurs and prehistoric life? Uh yeah, I mean that's 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 always been my goal. To be honest with you, when you know, I don't I don't honestly think that a paleontologist would read my books, and um, they're not going to take a lot of the science seriously. I mean, I've always not that I'm not that I claim to be Michael Crichton. Um, I would love to be some type of minor version of him, but but he always said that he wanted to write a book that the hardcore academics you know, kind of nod their head and say, yeah, I could see that happening. But for the most part, it was for the masses. Um, and you know that's that's always been something that's excited me, getting people into this stuff that um, wouldn't necessarily be into this type of fiction. And um, I I do think it, I do think it serves a purpose because you know a kid that meets something, let you know, let's just say they you know they go on and they look at the new Fallen Kingdom trailer. Um, you know, to myself, the name Baryonyx isn't anything new. I've, I've been reading dinosaurs for the last 25 years, but you know, to someone who watches that trailer and watches info on it, um, you know, they may find themselves interested in this subject matter, and they may find themselves reading about Baryonyx and, you know, how it was discovered in England in, I think, 1983 or whatever, and, you know, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So um, I, I, I do think that Hollywood and, you know, popular forms of media serve a purpose in, as far as getting people into it, because, you know, there, there, you know, there has to be a sex appeal to it. There has to be a kind of cool factor I think for a lot of people to take the journey, um, you know, which is one of the reasons, I guess, why Jurassic World is not always the most accurate. Um, you know, for the record, I still find it really entertaining. I, I know that it, you know, activity at times because, you know, you don't really see a real T-Rex and you know, we, we know that the Velociraptors weren't nearly that size, but, um, you know, the thing that I take away from it is, you know, the Velociraptors may not have been that size, but, you know, you have something like Deinonychus that was that size. So there's cool animals that were that size. But, but once again, it takes somebody having that instinct to then go along and do their research to be able to put two and two together and be able to paint a larger story. Um, so that's always been a big motivator to me is that I've wanted to, you know, tell the stories that haven't maybe necessarily got the most um, lime nut, sorry, haven't received the most amount of attention and to try and get as many people interested in in, 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 in the concepts as I can. <clears throat> That's a very admirable motivation for writing, uh, if I've ever heard one, Mike. Thank you. <laughs> very admirable. I mean, there's a whole menagerie of prehistoric animals that have never even been featured in movies or even on television that could really get the spotlight, be the star of their own books. And that's, a question, that's a question that I actually have got to come up with. Mine is, what are some prehistoric creatures you feel could be made the main subject of a novel, comic, 
or movie that hasn't either been any, any of the aforementioned ones in media, or if yeah. it has been showcased as in media, it should be more exposed. These could be dinosaurs or even other types of animals that are as well as the general public. Like, take, for example, the giant snake, Titanoboa. As far as I've seen, there are two published novels featuring this giant snake. But nothing, not much else. There's been no movie featuring this sure. giant snake yet. It's only had one appearance in that in Primeval, actually. Sure. Yeah, I mean, you know, to be honest, I guess those are always my frustrations. You know, when I think of something like Titanoboa, I think of a massive... There's a massive branding behind it, and there's a lot of star power behind it. And I think it could, it could definitely be a big star. And a lot of the YouTubers that I follow um, who talk about Jurassic World, you know, they've definitely asked for this animal to be in it. Um, I guess for the, the, the easier answer to that question would be that an animal that I think, I, I've even tried to pose it to a lot of people in the YouTube community who do Jurassic World Fallen Kingdom videos, you know, I've tried to pose this question, but... Um, Recently, I've, I've tried to ask a lot of people, you know, do they think that the Indoraptor, because, you know, the, the Jurassic World franchise has gone through so many lengths to trademark the name and build up this Indoraptor, and originally I was thinking the animal would be quite a bit smaller. I was thinking, you know, in the movie they said something that's a fraction of the size of the Indominus Rex, so I was picturing the size of a Velociraptor, but, you know, when we see the trailer, we see the jaws of the animal, and we see a very large animal. Not, not in, in par, on par with T-Rex, but most definitely bigger than the raptors. And I was asking, and I haven't gotten any responses yet, but, but I was asking, do we think that Mega Raptor could have taken the place of Indoraptor? Because the Mega Raptor, at about 20 to 25 feet in length and maybe 10 feet in height, seems to be the exact animal that Jurassic World has created. So... You know, once again, when you know when I go to see Jurassic World Fallen Kingdom, I'll be looking for Indoraptor going. You know, it's really cool to envision that there was an animal like that that really existed. You know, it was called Indo. I'm sorry, it was called Mega Raptor. But you know, the people that make these movies, um, you know, at least the actors, you can tell that a lot of times they've, you know, when they step on set, they're here in Carnotaurus, Carnotaurus for the first time. They're here in Baryonyx. Um, you know, they don't, they don't have the knowledge base. Um, yeah, I mean, that would be something I'd love to ask people. Do they think that Mega Raptor could have stepped in and been that animal? They wouldn't have even had to, you know, go about creating this hybrid animal. They would have been able to have something that was real, something that really existed, and, you know, something that I think could have held a lot of star power to it, because once again, it has that Raptor name in it. It has that brand ability that, Indo, that the Indoraptor has. But they obviously decided to go a different route. Um, but, but, but that's been something that I've thought of over the last couple of weeks. You know, do they think, or do we, as in the internet audience out there, think an animal like Megaraptor could have easily taken the place of, of the Indoraptor? You know, just as deadly, just as lethal, and pretty much on par with it in terms of size. That's a very interesting choice of dinosaur. And that, uh, Megaraptor is the dinosaur that has humongous, large finger claws. Yeah, yeah. It was it was once mistakenly thought to be a giant dromaeosaur until they found better remains. Sure, sure. There are plenty of raptors, even larger than Jurassic Park raptors, that should be featured in movies more often. But they've gotten a lot of attention in books, like, like Utah Raptor, for example. Yeah. And essentially, in, in a Primitive War, Ethan Pettis, Utah Raptors are quite the deadly menace in that novel. No doubt. Yeah, no doubt. Um, yeah, I've, I've seen the artwork. I've seen the artwork of the main Utah Raptor villain, Cyclops. Yeah. Quite nasty. He gets one of his eyes gouged out by a knife by a soldier. I, I, I was I was reading that when Michael Crichton, um, you know, back in the '80s when he was putting the book together, um, I think there was he was also calling on a lot of research um, into Deinonychus. Yes. And um, you know, from what I from what I understand, I I think he you know based the raptor entirely off of Deinonychus. It's just at the last second he made the the call to call it Velociraptor and you know to be honest the movie okay. movies make millions of dollars you know it, it, it looks like it was a wise choice because you you call them raptors and I don't know what the short term name for Deinonychus would be that's, that's not a very friendly name for the <laughs> public to pronounce so um, yeah, you know in, in that respect I, I think he did a wonderful job branding it um, and I, I don't know if I would have made that choice maybe, maybe if I had come up with the concept maybe I would have gone with Deinonychus and you know, we wouldn't be talking about Jurassic World because, you know, the, the, it never would have been made into a movie and it would have never 
you know, risen to the cultural popularity that it has today. And nowadays we have more rappers to more raptors to work with than we did back in the 1990s. Too. Dakota Raptor was only just described two years ago. Correct. Just about the actually same size and even a little larger than the Raptors in Jurassic Park. Correct. Took the scales at over almost 800 pounds. Correct. And lived like it lived alongside Tyrannosaurus Rex, so that would have made that ending scene in the first movie more accurate if those were Dakota Raptors instead of Velociraptors. Mm-hmm. You know, I I would love to see a movie about Nostra and Siva. Nostra and Siva is a pretty scary and intimidating looking animal. The Gorgonopsid. Yeah, the Gorgonopsid. The Rapsid. Yep. Animals that have been featured on Primeval already. Mm-hmm. Those are creatures that definitely should get more spotlight in big budget films. Reptile yeah, version of a saber tooth tiger. <laughs> yeah, we've had books about saber tooth cats still plenty of times. There was one that Jeff Rovin wrote in the 90s called Fatalis about a pride of Smilodon that were f- flash frozen in a cave and they get thawed out and they go on a killing spree mm-hmm. in the California well, in the California Badlands. Well, there's also another Cybertooth cat novel called Siberius, mm-hmm. which has a group of a group of Smilodons, an evolved Smilodon species living in Siberia. Mm-hmm. Very interesting story. And there's also another one written by Alan Nazis is called Smilodon, where it's the cat is genetically reconstructed and brought back, goes on a loose, killing folks and all that. <laughs> I don't, I, I, I don't know if you guys ever follow. Um, there's this guy on YouTube I've, I've watched over the years, not. Not too much in recent times, but his name is Dinosaur George. Oh yeah, Dinosaur George Blasting. He was our one of our guests we interviewed. Oh, okay, nice. I mean, you know, he he's a pretty cool guy because he. Um, I've never talked to him per se, but you know, he's pretty cool because I guess he's not a paleontologist by background. He kind of just self taught, which you know, to me, I like because that 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 adds a certain element <laughs> instead of just a, a scientifically trained person. But I, I remember he had a he said something on his videos once, which really stuck with me and that's most people don't want to be educated about dinosaurs they just want to be entertained about them and I think the Jurassic World and Jurassic Park movies they definitely hint to that that people line up in droves to see the movie but I'd be curious to see how many people are logging on to Wikipedia and reading about baryonics um, not that I'm you know like I said I'm, I'm fascinated by these animals you know I've loved this stuff ever since childhood I've read up on these creatures for a long time. Uh, you know, they made up the basis of childhood. But you know, to the average person, um, you know, they're 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 you know they're kind of foreigners to the to the average person's vocabulary. So I think when they're making these movies, they really keep that in mind that um, T. Rex, Triceratops, Stegosaurus, Velociraptor. To, to, to most people, there's only four or five dinosaurs, Apatosaurus, Brontosaurus. There's only four or five dinosaurs that have ever existed, and those are the ones that everybody knows. And there's basically no other animals to the to the average person who's going to you know who's going to see the movie. Um, and uh, over the over the years, I've I've had the pleasure of keeping in touch with Steve Alton, and um, you know I've I've done a lot of work for him, and you know done a lot of marketing, tried to help him sell books and. And um, I, I think they've kind of run into the issue of um, branding lately where, you know, the book was originally called Meg, but when you type in Meg, um, you know, Meg Ryan, the actress may come up, uh, Meg, Meg, Meg Whitman, the founder of eBay, uh, billionaire who ran to be governor of California may come up. So I think now they ran into the issue of they're going to call it The Meg, and I think that's specifically to try and get rid of when you type in Meg, you may you may get a woman come up instead of the actual animal. Um, yeah, it's tough. I mean, I, I I would love to be a fly on the wall and sit in on their branding meetings and discuss how they're going to, you know, communicate an animal such as Megalodon to the average person in just one word. Um, you know, because when you say Megalodon, you know, to my wife, you know, she's now aware of all these terms, so she knows these animals, but in to the average person, um, it may be tough to understand if they know that, you know, the, you know, the term Meg, um, I don't know. I guess we'll have to wait and see how it, how it does at the box office. I'm, I'm definitely cheering, cheering it on. I mean, I hope, I hope the thing is as big, I hope the movie is as big as 
the Fallen Kingdom movie that comes out. You know, they're coming out two months apart, so I hope that the sales from Fallen Kingdom spur the sales for The Meg, which is coming out in August. So um, I hope they, you know, that they kind of piggyback one another. But I, I guess we'll have to wait and see the branding and the concept as far as the title that they're using, if, it, if it's going to be a, a success or not. If it was me, I'd put a giant tooth on the poster. Yeah, no doubt. Um, a giant tooth or a shark coming out of the water about to attack a helicopter. I've seen some awesome promotional potential posters for this movie that would easily yeah. get people hooked. Yeah, or even better yet, showing the Tyrannosaurus Rex in the jaws of the shark with the water turning with blood like on the first revised edition of the first book. That, yeah. would, get people, that would get people's attention. Like, holy crap, this thing can kill a T-Rex. One of the reasons why I would love to see a Gorgonopsid in a movie is because Gorgonopsid was the original Sabretooth, and a lot of people are not aware of that. A lot of people think that the, the Smilodon invented the saber teeth, but the, the Smilodon really affected it. Gorgonopsid was really the animal that invented saber teeth. Yeah, this uh, saber teeth as a whole evolved across multiple lineages multiple times over the course of like 300 million years mm-hmm. even amongst mammals it's not just in true cats there were also marsupials that had saber teeth as well like mm-hmm. thylaka smilus for example just to name the big one and there's also an animal that's sort of like one but it's not exactly it's called thylakaleo it lived in australia yeah they had the chisels a, yeah teeth like bolt cutters extreme, extremely powerful bite one that's said to be the strongest pound for pound bite of any carnivorous mammal. That would be a terrifying animal to have in a novel. Yeah. Think of a, yeah, no. think of a, think of a leopard, a cat, an animal that can attack from the trees, it can tear your, tear your jugular of its claws, and snap your snap your neck vertebrae with a single chop of those incisors. Yeah, no doubt. Uh, and this thing, probably, this thing could prey on animals the size of a rhinoceros, or the giant diprotodon. Yeah. Think about how scary a Gorgonopsid would be. I mean, that's a pretty intimidating-looking animal. I, yeah. I, yeah, I, I would put, I, I would very quickly run the other way if I came face to face with one of those things. <laughs> me too. Me too. Uh, uh, that's, that's why I'm more scared of that, Cleo, is that that thing is the real-life drop bear. Yeah. yeah. yeah um. Yeah. yeah. No. I mean, you know. A lot of times through, I think, prehistory, you know, there's so many animals that I wish would get attention. Uh, I mean, even even the American lion is something that I never hear of until I went to the La Brea Tar Pits last August. And um, it, it's definitely something I've never read up on. But I, I was shocked to find how, how large this animal was and, you know, how intimidating, you know, stumbling upon this American lion would have been. But, you know, for the most part, the saber tooth kind of has the limelight, has the spotlight for any type of pop culture that you're going to see in movies or TV shows or books. Um, That's exactly. That's another animal I was going to bring up. The American lion would be perfect, a perfect animal to have in a novel all its own. Just think of a tiger, a tiger, but almost triple, almost triple the size, possibly living in prides, possibly larger sized prides than modern lions, and probably take cable clearing out the biggest of game. Definitely. From, From mammoths, mastodons, giant bison, horse, possibly even ground sloth. Definitely, definitely. Yeah, there was also an interesting study I just seen the other day that that may reveal what coloration these cats actually were. They may have been a possibly a reddish coloration in their skin and fur. Nice. Based, based, nice. On some, based on some new findings found in a cave down in South America, Patagonia, including nice. a, a new a skin sample and a, and a new cave painting done by Paleo Indians of a giant red-colored cat. I'm gonna have to do some research on that. <laughs> yeah, I've got I've got some of the papers, but nice. I've been in, I've been in, I've been in talk with a mammal expert in a group named Velazar Simonovsky, and he's pointing out that there may have been some <laughs> potential issues with this study in terms of its accuracy. Nice. So it's still a little controversial. Nice. But it's still interesting that Amer- that America's biggest cat may have been red in color. Yeah. yeah very true. Very true. Very very uh-huh. scary little thing to have on screen. So, you, you know, there's so many animals, it's, um, you know, like I said, it's pretty much my whole life, as far as movies go, it's always been a disappointment that you can't see more of these things, um, 
I mean, I, I, I guess it just goes down to brandability. It, people are really busy, busy working their jobs, busy commuting. And if they're going to see a poster, I guess they have to be able to understand it quickly without, you know, doing any type of research. But, yeah, I mean, definitely the things we've covered as far as, you know, a giant shark fin, which is the size of a sailboat, I, I, I think is going to get most people. Um, I mean, I mean, I guess it's, it's, you know, it's really just a matter of how you brand it and how you market it to the public in that, uh, you know, Steve Alton's book uh, from 2004, Primal Waters, um, I you know, they, you know, they called it a high concept because he was able to brand it in two words. He just called it Jurassic Shark. And I guess they always say in the writing world, you know, the, the fewer sentences or the fewer words you can brand something strong, you know, the higher the concept you have. So he had a really strong, you know, I, I, I read a lot of James Rollins books. And um, he was quoted as saying that James Rollins had a really big concept because he was able to get the message out in just two words, Jurassic Shark. And I think everybody in the entire world would probably understand what that means or what that entails, with, you know, without even being an emotional image or a picture. Exactly. Or you just say Jaws meets Jurassic Park. They would get the, sure. concept, they'd sure. get the concept right away because most people have seen Jaws. They know the premise. A shark, a great white shark goes on a killing spree off a beach. Jurassic Park is about prehistoric animals. Now, a prehistoric giant shark going on the loose in the oceans, killing whales, sinking ships, and eating people. That's something that would be easily understood. That's basically the premise of the first book. Sure, sure. And there's been a lot more mag books, a lot more books featuring Megalodon released since then, a whole sleuth of directed video movies that have not been good. So the movie we're getting this year, that's the first professional big-budget mag movie that we're getting, period. Guys, I'm, yeah. I'm, I'm, I'm going to have to... Would it be okay if we uh, continue this another time? I'm gonna have to. Um, I got a text from my wife saying that she's that she needs a ride home from work. I'm gonna have to get her in a couple minutes. Um, I'm sorry to cut it short on my end, but uh, yeah, I mean Steve Alton even has the lock coming up. Uh, the lock is being looked into as um, you know about the Loch Ness monster. I was reading recently that it looks like that's been optioned as well. So I guess it's all gonna determine how well his book does if, if Meg does really well I, I think they'll put into production a lot of his other movies he has a lot of other great concepts up there. Um, it all goes back to if they make money if they make money uh, they'll put that lock into production quickly um, if for some reason it stumbles maybe they'll but you know what um, I have a feeling it's, I have a feeling it's going to be good because it's financed by people in China and as a result of the financing in China I believe the Megalodon is supposed to surface in China so I think, I think they're going to do a lot of promotional work over in Asia, and I think the concept is going to go over really big. Um, I've, I've known Steve Allen for a long, long time, so I'm really keeping my fingers crossed for him. He's a really nice guy. Uh, I'm keeping my fingers crossed that, that uh, he can he can really hit a home run here with the, with the potential billion-dollar franchise. Well, if it does hit the billion-dollar mark, then he's perhaps going to be an even bigger, best-selling rich guy than he already is. No doubt, no doubt, no doubt. Any other questions you guys have that um, you guys think were, you know, pertaining to this episode or just I have, wanting uh, a response? I have one more. Um, yeah, sure. What uh, dinosaur video games would you like to see be made into a movie? That's, that, that's actually a really good question. Um, I actually haven't had a chance to play the game. Uh, but uh, the, uh, the game Saurian is, uh, I haven't had a chance to buy it or I haven't had a chance to play it, but I did follow it on Kickstarter and I was really pleased to see that Saurian got the $250,000 that they were asking for, so they really got a lot of money. Uh, I, I think that, that would make for an awesome movie, uh, but once again, I haven't I haven't actually played it, I, but I have seen screenshots of it on YouTube and I have seen some people covering it, but it's a really accurate uh, video game. Uh, probably one of the most accurate games that I've imagined that's come out to date yet. Um, so I, I would definitely love to see that put into production. Yeah, another game that just complete another dinosaur game that just finished its Kickstarter a few days ago is uh, Prehistoric Kingdom from Shadow Raven Studios. Nice, nice. Yeah, they've hit, they've hit almost all of their stretch goals, and I'm especially looking forward to seeing how this game turns out. Nice. I've seen the con seen the concept art, I've seen the Red Dead Gameplay Mechanics. This looks like it's gonna be 
my it's gonna be my favorite of the two dinosaur games. Favorite of the two dinosaur zoo games out there between this one and Mesozoica. Uh, you guys, I'm, I'm gonna have to unfortunately get going here. Okay. Um, I'm, I'm really sorry on my end. Um, I'm, I'm sorry right. about the difficulties that we ran into as far as the hour that I built for you guys. So I, I, I owe you guys. Uh, I'll be more than happy to mail you guys some paperback books. Greg, if you, if you can just send me everyone's address, I'll be more than happy to mail oh. some books out. Okay, sure. Thank sure. you. Just, just send me addresses. I'll, 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 I'll pop them in the mail to you guys. Thanks. Oh, that's that. We will greatly appreciate that, man. <laughs> hey, 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 thank you guys. Thank you guys for all you do, and uh, th thanks for having me on today. You're very welcome. Oh, thanks. Uh, thank you. Uh, okay, guys. Let us, and let us know if you'll be available to join us for the big special two weeks from now. I oh, will. Uh, I'll, I'll, I'll make myself available. So uh, just just keep me posted by email, and uh, thanks for uh, putting all this together, Greg. Okay, thanks. Uh, at least you now know how to use Skype now again. <laughs> You're right. You're right. Thank, thanks a lot, you guys. Uh, send, me, send me your addresses. I'll, I'll be more than happy to put that all stuff right. in the mail. Yep, I'll send it to you in my follow-up email. All right. All, right, all right, take care, you guys. Good night. Take Thank care, you. you guys. All right, it's uh, on. Oh, Alan? Yeah. Well, let me hang on a sec. I'm already Davis. on. Oh. oh. Right, Alan okay. Davis, let me get him in here real quick. That way he can listen to us. All right. Even though Al Alan's not gonna be able to talk with us today, he'll still be able to you know, listen in and all that. Well, anyhow, I am recording anyway. Anyhow, let me turn this off real quick. Okay, tonight we are recording a rather interesting special of the Prehistory: A Traveler's Guide podcast. I am the showrunner Greg Nunn, and with me tonight are my usual my usual squad of hosts: Samuel Eiler and Chris Grohl. I'm Eiler, Chris Grohl, and uh, Scott Martis. And tonight we have a lot of extra special guests on to discuss dinosaurs and prehistoric beasts in the popular culture, be it in movies, television, comic books, or even video games. Our special guests include author Tom Hopp of the Dinosaur War series, special effects sculptor Jeff Farley, known for working on Carnosaur and the 1998 American Godzilla film, including its 1994 first draft. And returning to the show in over a year is also Dr. Thomas Holtz. And then last week we also bring in, uh, I guess, a uh, paleontologist and artist overall, Danny Roth. So to our newcomers to the program, welcome aboard. Glad to be here. Thank you. Boy, I feel like I'm uh, on the totem pole. It's like uh, with, with all the esteemed uh, members. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm glad to be back. Yes, it's been a long time, Tom. Yes. Long time in here. You're just uh, on a panel discussing dinosaur movies and pop culture. Mm -hmm. We're not so. If we want to get things started, let's discuss the probably the most influential film on this whole series of discussions, <laughs> Jurassic Park. I think I'll hand it off to Danny to start it off. How Jurassic Park really has influenced dinosaur percept dinosaurs in pop culture and the, the public's perception of them as a whole. I I think it's a good jumping point because I think uh, everyone will agree with me to an aspect is that dinosaurs in media up to Jurassic Park were portrayed as still these slow moving tail dragging um, examples with some rare instances of scientifically accurate representations at the time because the dinosaur renaissance that happened started in the 1960s with discovery of Deinonychus John Ostrom's uh, monograph on it and the boom in the industry of seeing dinosaurs as more active, bird-like, um, endothermic, warm-blooded active animals wasn't accepted in the popular culture, because even during that time we get movies like Valley of Guanji, we get uh, Planet of the Dinosaurs, like the, all these other movies that have dinosaurs in them still show them similar to the old Charles R. Knight images. We get to Jurassic Park, we've got a lot more scientific... Uh, investment into the film on behalf of Steven Spielberg and the research Michael Crichton did, and then that just blows everything out of the water here. We've got fast-acting, realistic dinosaurs, and then everything after that is Jurassic Park-like. They move like the dinosaurs in Jurassic Park. They they look like them to an extent, especially in dinosaurs and being used as media and advertisements for these different uh, movies and specials and everything else coming up here. And it was a drastic change because Jurassic Park's influence then 
drastically changed the public's perception of that, which then changed it in pop culture as a whole. Video games were doing it. Uh, comics were doing it. Whereas up to that point, there wasn't much scientific accuracy or validity being led to dinosaurs and media up to Jurassic Park's release and popularity. Um, if anyone has anything else to add here, I can, I can ramble for a while. I don't want to take over the entire thing, but I can ramble a lot, a lot about this. Sorry. One thing to add is that not only was it the general images of dinosaurs that it brought to a lot of people, there were some specific dinosaurs it brought to people. I know younger people do not grasp this or won't believe me when I tell them this, but prior to 1993 and 94, if you said the word velociraptor to people, only paleontologists and dino fans knew what that word meant. Velociraptor was an obscure animal. It would, it, it would be the equivalent to someone saying Skeletosaurus. Um, and, I have, and I actually have to add on to that my own story involving Velociraptor, because ah. at this point, I knew Deinonychus, and Deinonychus was becoming my favorite dinosaur at, up to this point, due to a number of reasons, but I saw Jurassic Park, and here's why Jurassic Park is important for public perception, and why movies are important for public perception. I was a kid, and the Jurassic, I got to collect everything Jurassic Park, so for the first months, first years after seeing the film, I was getting magazines, I was collecting toys, and I was watching the movie several times over. In one of the movie production uh, magazines, they had information on the dinosaurs, and they said for Velociraptor, it is was 6 feet tall and 11 feet long. Mm-hmm. My science books were telling me the exact opposite. It was 6 feet long, or 3 feet tall, about 6 to 7 feet long. And my the reason it was so hard for me to understand that the book, my science books were right, and the movie books were wrong was because of how much of an influence it had on me to change my perception of how I looked at dinosaurs. And I thought the movie was right, my books were wrong. And that's why scientific accuracy, especially in the Jurassic Park films, especially in the Jurassic World films, Mm -hmm. are so important. And they don't go for accuracy anymore in the guise of nostalgia for Jurassic Park. So, again, Velociraptor didn't know what it was, at all. It's a raptor. It's it's these well, it's a dromaeosaur. Love dromaeosaurs. Instantly loved it. I thought my science books were wrong, but the movie was right for the longest time until I realized, oh, that's not right. Oh, there's a lot in this movie that isn't right, but there's also a lot that they did right. Mm-hmm. Well, I think it's a bit of artistic mm-hmm. license there, you know, they, they simply called it Velociraptor. Uh, these days, I think we would know it as a Utah raptor, probably. That's about the right size comparison. Uh, and even so, all it is some CG animation. Anyway, it isn't a dinosaur. <laughs> right. right. It is true. Right. <laughs> there is an interesting thing about that, though, because if you remember Gregory S. Paul in the late 80s yeah. was yes. trying to trying to put forth the idea that Deinonychus atropius was a different species of Velociraptor, Velociraptor atropius. Exactly. The thing right. is, it, it's not. They're, 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 that, they're, that never grabbed hold here, but I think it may have influenced Crichton enough to where, and Spielberg enough, because the other thing is Spielberg wanted the raptors much larger because he wanted he wanted villains, and you know, turkeys are villains, but they can be terrifying. That's um, 100% true, Denny. That's, I, I've actually read up in interviews from my current events, and he actually stated he did take notes from Greg Paul in regards to the Velociraptors of his novel being Deinonychus and Aeropus and things of that sort of nature. Right, yeah, that, yeah, yeah exactly. It's not even it's not even a question. It, it is it is in print that uh, that Crichton used predatory dinosaurs of the world, Greg's uh, 1988 book, uh, as well as um, uh, Horner's uh, Dinosaur Lives and, uh, and Bacher's um, oh, dinosaur, Dinos- heresy. dinosaur heresies. Right, those were because those were yeah. the three. Don't, the don't forget, three. he also threw in a bit of Westworld, also. Right, yeah, but he used, he used those three, those three of the yeah. major dinosaur books because they were at the time the three most recent popular audience, but well researched books about dinosaur paleontology. So it was a perfectly reasonable <laughs> thing for him to do in terms of the uh, the dinosaur side of things. Uh, which is also the reason that you know Metriacanthosaurus gets a throwaway image on um, on 
to Jurassic Park uh, in the, the, the freezing chamber where they've got the various DNA stored. You know, Metricanthosaurus is an obscure dinosaur even among paleontologists, but Greg Paul had synonymized Metriacanthosaurus, which is an English Middle Jurassic theropod, with Yangchuanosaurus, which is still relatively obscure, but it's known from some really good skeletons. And it's the cover girl. Uh, Yangchuanosaurus, as Metriacanthosaurus, is the cover girl on, uh, on predatory dinosaurs of the world. And so uh, the filmmaker said, this is a cool-looking dinosaur. We're going to work it in here. Even though we don't ever see the dinosaur, we're at least going to mention it and put it in there. So it, it is an extremely influential book for the creation of, of the Jurassic Park phenomenon. Yeah, well, that's the mentality of a, of a producer. Is, is, uh, is, as long as it looks cool, that's that's 99% of the, <laughs> of the job I get. They're, and they're that's ninety percent of your budget, right there. It looks cool. Okay, where it's in. Yeah, that's, 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 really, that's generally their uh, you know, their mentality, but uh, <laughs> but uh, they, they know what off. Right. How many people so, have uh, Dilophosaurus before Jurassic Park got it? I think Dilophosaurus wasn't yeah. very well known until Jurassic Park came out. Exactly. And then they yeah. even got that. So. And then, of course, every every. Every pop culture depiction of Dilophosaurus has it doing what? Spitting. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Oh, yeah. Spitting, spitting with the with spitting and with the yeah. frill. Yeah. yeah Not always frill. with the frill though. Not always with the frill. Although that does show up in a lot of media here. But that's this, this is my point though. You guys, are, we're all on the same page here. The influence and impact of a series like Jurassic Park, from how it was presented, how it made the dinosaurs look, how well they did for the entire production. I was at one what three Academy Awards for visual effects. Uh, 94, I think. Yes. But it's it's that kind of impact that changed the entire paradigm of how the public perceived dinosaurs. Mm -hmm. And then for and then since then, in the last 25 years, it's been what Jurassic Park style dinosaurs. Even though in Jurassic World they had the opportunity to update these, getting people to understand that dinosaurs are feathered, particularly theropods, and maybe some uh, ceratopsians, depending on 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 where that falls, where that characteristic falls within the entire clade. I know Stachosaurus has preserved uh, quill feathers on its tail. Um, other dinosaurs have a bunch of other feathers ranging from filaments to full-blown flight feathers and other kind of uh, basal feathers here. But that's still taking such a hard time to catch on, but Jurassic World had such a great opportunity to take onto that Grab that nostalgia because they know how many people are going to go see Jurassic World. It's Jurassic Park sequel 20 years after the fact. We're all going to go see it. No, no, no lie. But they don't update the models to match the scientific accuracy like they did when they went to go do Jurassic Park, even though they still had a lot of scientific inaccuracies in it. Yeah, uh, yeah indeed. And uh, Alan actually just mentioned something here that might catch you guys' interest about the first appearance of Deinonychus in pop culture. He mentions that his first sci-fi appearance was in a David Gerald novel titled Death Beast from 1978. That's right. That's right. And I know, I think its first appearance in any kind of cartoon was Dino Riders. In any kind of visual media was Dino Riders. And then okay. it subsequent went to the toys here. And that predates Jurassic Park by at least three to five years. Yes. And it also yeah. had a starring role in the Connoisseur book as well. The I, I believe that is correct. I, I, I've only read a summary of the Carnosaur book. I haven't actually gotten a like copy that. of it. Yeah. Um, I've, I've read the book. I can give you the rundown of all out. the different, different creatures that appear. You have the Deinonychus, of which there are several. You have a, a Scolosaurus, a type of Ankylosaurid. You have the uh, Megalosaurus. You have, for the big meat eater, you have a Tarbosaurus. There's a young Brachiosaurus. Of so there's a brachiosaurus in this, a young one. There's also a, a type of theropod called Beckel spinix, which might be an outdated genus. It's depicted as right. quadrupedal in the book. And there's also, for non dinosaurian reptiles, there's a plesiosaur that goes on, a, goes on the loose in a river and starts you know, eating people. <sighs> That's personally yeah, my favorite of all from? the creatures is the uh, plesiosaur from the book. And ironically, not a single one belongs in Carnosauria. No, there are some, uh, yeah, there oh, are some... Oh, isn't Carnosauria uh, no longer, is it just a defunct uh, grouping anyway? No, 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 no. Uh, Carnosauria has been redefined years and years ago 
as it's the plate of everything that's Allosaurus and everything closer to Allosaurus than to Megalosaurus or Tyrannosaurus or what have you. So it's essentially the same as what people say, what people call Allosauroidea. There's a slight difference between the two, but it's sort of te a technical distinction that isn't really that much of a big difference. So um, Carcharodontosaurus and Acrocanthosaurus and Allosaurus and um, creatures of the Neovenator and so forth would be would be Carnosaurs, uh, but of the creatures in the book Carnosaur, uh, in the book Carnosaur. Yeah, then the, even Beckel Spinax, which is Elzy Spinax, is almost certainly a megalosaurid. So it's a megalosauroid, so it's outside Carnosauria. So, oops, but it's a cool word, so that's fine. It, it's, it's, it sounds like carnage. Exactly. And that's, you want that in a horror in a horror story anyways. Yeah, yeah. No I believe in the book there was some, uh, some uh, juvenile uh, or infant, uh, I can't remember if they were... Tyrannosaurs, or if they were, uh, or if they were another, another, uh, you know. Uh, but uh, they were. Uh, I do remember that from the book, so maybe they're, they're getting a little closer there. Um, yeah. But uh, as, as far as that goes, the book fairly forgettable. Yeah. Yeah. The, there were some juvenile T. Rexes that that killed the uh, the wife of the lead villain of the book at the end in the Carnosaur book. So we did have T. Rex in the book, but just not fully grown. Just as little chicks. That was a little. That was a nice. Uh, that was a nice change, though, because you expect the uh, you expect the opposite. Hello. Exactly. Well, I think up to that point, primarily, well, because Tarbosaurus is still a rather large carnosaur. It's still a tyrannosaur, isn't it? Exactly. Yeah, it's one of the one of the big three largest of the tyrannosaur family. The others being T. Rex and Jushin Tyrannus. Yeah. Right. But I think for the popular culture aspect of it is that all. Major villains or major antagonists from the Valley of Guanji through the Beast of Yucca Flats, um, even through like Planet of the Dinosaurs, um, the original 1925 Lost World, the big antagonists have always been these large, heavy, large headed, tyrannosaurid animals, or at least large right. theropods. Um, right. Because Valley of Guanji, I keep that, hearing, right. was supposed to be an allosaur, but it's got uh, three fingers on it, and that's due to a, a, what I argue is a large range of factors of misconception based primarily well, on Charles R. Knight's bad, original Charles paintings Knight. of Tyrannosaurus Rex. Yeah, I've read yeah. it. Absolutely. That's okay. That's the, uh, that's the classic uh, uh, old world view, and, and right. certainly that's where O'Brien and, uh, and then extended the Marcel Delgado um, uh, in the design of, the, of all the puppets. Uh, for that, for uh, and then creation, which then eventually uh, morphed into uh, King Kong, because a lot of the puppets uh, for King Kong were originally made for a production called Creation. Yes, indeed. Um, so, um, but but again, that was sort of the world view at the time. There was, you know, the emphasis was more on adventure. I mean, Cooper and Shotsap being actual real world adventurers. And, the, and King Kong being a distillation of, of their personal views along with, with the uh, um, Okay, it looks like we've lost Jeff for a second but anyhow, Alan Divas actually brought up something here in a message here regarding Car Store, another story that actually shows some similarities to it. He says here, I always thought it a strange yet not condemning coincidence that Crichton's novel came out during the same month as did Alan Steele's Trembling Earth in Asimov's Science Magazine, November 1990. Both stories dealt with genetic dinosaurs and involved raptors. Yes, and I have an autographed copy of that issue that I got from Alan Steele while he was drunk, and so he misspells my name. But, <laughs> <laughs> uh, but yeah, it, it, was, it was funny. It came out at almost exactly the same time, and it also involves, yeah, cloned... Uh, Deinonychus resurrected um, and doing horrible things to people. Um, so sadly, sadly, that one has not made it to uh, big screen or small screen or anything of that nature. I find it odd, if not interesting, that in the in the '80s we seem to be getting a lot more of these genetic kind of shows that talk about genetic engineering and, and all sorts of stuff because at that time. If I remember correctly, genetic engineering was really big in the mind's eye populace, which also ties into a bit to pop culture with dinosaurs is this how science is also portrayed in the media 
And of course, we start talking about like we're we're doing human genome testing. We can do all the all the new chromosome testing that you can get for like twenty bucks or something like that. It's kind of fascinating that we get a lot more media in that time, like in that early eighties to mid early no mid to late eighties that go over specifically genetic engineering and genetic modification as a plot point in the novel itself. Crichton had a couple of novels like that. Um, I think Andromeda the Strain maybe came out in the early 80s. Jurassic Park was in 89. We've got a couple of these other novels we just mentioned here, these other uh, fiction works. We've got, you no know, something. Well, at least one of the Godzilla movies came out this year, also addressing the concept of genetic engineering as a weapon and a resource. So I find it interesting that that starts to gravitate and that starts to shoot bleed into other kinds of media that we work yeah. with here, especially as scientists. Yeah. yeah. I am a genetic engineer, so, uh, you know, uh, careful what you say. Yeah. <laughs> I don't think it's bad. Right. It's, I'm just saying. It's, it's, only, like it's only when people try to play engine. God and try to create weaponized dinosaurs that I might take offense at it. Well, I've created new life forms in the test tube, but uh, haven't gotten all the way to dinosaurs yet. Nah. Hey, I want Dino Riders. I don't know what you're talking about. <laughs> Same. <laughs> you know, okay, I, yeah. I think it's kind of um, interesting, though, now that there's things like, as you mentioned, 23 and Me and all those other sort of stuff, and people just have access to their own genome in a way they didn't before. If it's going to sort of take the fangs out of genetic engineering horror stories, sort of the way when, you know, your grandma is posting her recipes on computers sort of took away AI. The, the sort of evil AI used to be such a common trope in science fiction. You know, computers were taking over the world. And it's not to say that there aren't stories like that anymore, but it becomes a lot less scary when a computer is no longer a thing that takes up an entire basement at some, you know, NSA lab and is now something that you can hold in your hand and show cat pictures with. So I think, you know, just genetic genetic information becomes just much more commonplace uh, that I think maybe the, the fear of it might go away and people might treat it a, like more of a serious tool and form of science and so forth and be less scared about it, I hope. I, I don't want to counter that a little bit because the fear of technology now is the fact that it's going to take over in the way like, you know, Skynet in the Terminal movies. Mm. But it's now more of a, an invasion of what you can or can't do. So it's a different kind of control because of how invasive technology is in our lives. I mean, look at what we're doing now. We're on a we're on a computer going through a high speed connection, talking to one another in, in almost real time with very little lag on every side, and that changes how we interact with each other. And then with when you get into that, because of my own experience and my own current uh, occupation, is a bunch of. You know how you can track that, how you can monitor that, how you can monetize that, how you can target sell. So the the fear is shifted in that aspect. I think for genetic engineering in this specific instance, I think the fear is going to shift another direction. We just haven't seen which one is going to go yet. Mm-hmm. I think we're still kind of in that infancy of it's turning more helpful, but it's going to turn to a different, darker side than just playing God. It's going to shift somewhere else that's going to become the new fear aspect of that technology itself. Well, here's the thing. Genetic engineering has been proposed as far back as the 1920s as Alan reveals. I'll read off another thing he just posted here. The idea of genetically engineered prehistoric animals goes back to 1929 through John Tain's The Greatest Adventure, Piers Anthony's Baluk, Bionicothier, not a dinosaur. Then there's also a similar one from 1929, Robert Wells' The Parasaurians, all novels, good ones. Ah, oh, cool. Excellent. All right, Sam has his first question he'd like to ask us all as a panel. Uh, where, do you, well, where do you think the uh, Jurassic Park franchise will go from here on? I mean, what are your opinions? Hmm. Hard to guess. Good question. We'll definitely. I think I'll know more personally after after seeing Fallen Kingdom this summer. Well, me personally, here's what I think. I, I think after they do Fallen Kingdom, they should do just one more Jurassic Park film, and I kind of think that that ought to be it for the series, because I, I really can't think of any other places the series can go after that. It, if, if, if I'm to hazard a guess, something I would like to see is some more of that genetic cloning modification, because 
the plot point from Lost World about the Indominus Rex was brought up in an old in a in a third generation toy line called Jurassic Park Chaos Effect, where they were crossbreeding and cross genetic engineering a whole bunch of chimeric animals based out of dinosaurs here. Um, I'd like to see that on film, but I'm not expecting it because that would be kind of cool for me to see. But that's also pushing it so far into the realm of science fiction that it kind of ceases to be believable like Jurassic Park was for what it could do after you suspend your disbelief for the cloning and the 65 million year old or more older DNA but as far as what I think the franchise is going to do it's I can't say and I kind of I want it to end on a good note like if it after Fallen Kingdom I kind of want it to, to end to be honest I want it to be what we've got so far the good memories we've had with it and then that's that's it. Is what I want. I have a different reason for wanting it to end as well. I, I have a little sob story that I uh, wrap every once in a while when I get in conversations like this. Uh, a few years back, my Dinosaur Wars novels attracted the attention of a let's just say a director and producer at a major motion picture company, and he called me up and he, he arranged a, an option. And we were moving forward on a $200 million production of Dinosaur Wars. And he said, ah, i got to tell you, even as we're inking this deal, rumors are Spielberg's going to announce Jurassic Park 4. So ah, back in that time frame. And he said, if he does, this deal's dead. So I had that just in the tip of my fingertips, you know. And then it was, oops, not happening. Right. <laughs> So I would, I would like them to go away, and, and let me say, let me try to uh, take the personal out of it and, and say why, uh, as a writer, what I see that has been wrong from the start. In fact, Michael Crichton's one weakness, a brilliant guy, brilliant idea man for coming up with, with anything from the Andromeda strain to Jurassic Park. I'm not going to knock his intellect or anything like that, but for whatever reason, he always neglected characters, as in yes. humans. And he neglected them so badly that one of the things that's underlying this conversation right now is, well, you know, couldn't they have, like, some heroes? Uh, how about a heroine? How about a love uh, story? You know, and all those things are just so not there that, you know, so then, well, what dinosaur are you going to make? Maybe we better stick parts of one onto another because, you know, what else are we going to do? You know, so the story lacks depth, and all of, all of Michael's stories do lack depth, although, I mean, they're great ideas. Right. Not right. Uh, but I, I, would, I would like to see the Jurassic Park either cut it out and go away, or, you know, have a young man and young woman meet each other in the middle of an island with Tyrannosaurus all around and fall in love or something like that. Now, I'll put a plug in here. That's exactly what it's all about with my Dinosaur Wars. <laughs> <laughs> the Fang Ray, the, uh, you know, Anne Darrow and, and Jack Driscoll of King Kong, right? Mm -hmm. Same kind of thing. And that is what makes a story great. Uh, you True. know, look at Gojira or Godzilla King of the Monsters. It's the uh, it's the love triangle that really propels the story. Right. Yeah. Yes, indeed. Add to add some uh, some uh, pepper and some interest. Yeah. You know, so, uh, the human uh, interest. Element. I love dinosaurs, and I'm writing the Dinosaur Wars series. Every book is going to feature one or several cool dinosaurs, maybe that just recently been described, and go into great deal about their behavior and their appearance and all those things that paleontologists find it hard to say because, again, all they've got is bone evidence. They don't have the look or the activities of dinosaurs. That is my underlying motive for the Dinosaur Wars series, but you can't have a story where, gee, aren't these dinosaurs cool looking? Mm -hmm. you, know, you gotta go farther. And so if you have a couple of humans running under their feet trying to get away, and they're falling in love in the meantime, that makes for story, you know, much yeah. more interesting story. I agree. I I love her ideas. Personally, I, I 
I actually think this would make an interesting idea for a story or a movie. And what it's uh, kind of what the, the Danny was talking about earlier, how uh, there was a Jurassic Park chaos effect, and they were crossbreeding dinosaurs. Well, that kind of that, that's kind of made me made me think a couple of times. If we ever do end up cloning dinosaurs one day, could the next step be maybe creating whole new species of dinosaurs through hybridization? Or, or maybe somehow controlling the evolution of dinosaurs. How? I mean, what's the next step after we create? Well, I'll tell you. Things? Funny, it's because the because the toy line had a uh, hybrid. It was a it was a Triceratops Stegosaurus hybrid for the last film, and it made me laugh because it, uh, I went immediately right back to your Hunter from the Future, in which they have a Stegosaurus, uh, uh, you know, Triceratops hybrid the beginning of the film it's exactly the same you know and it must have been somebody who uh, was watching work working on uh, from far, uh, was it uh, Jurassic World you know must have uh, been a your fan yeah well yeah. The, the funny thing you mentioned that is because in the chaos effect toy line as I remember it there was a Triceratops Stegosaurus actual little hybrid toy that was in that oh. series as well so it's yeah, yeah. I don't think it's a Ununique thing. Even in the Jurassic World game has that here. Of course, that's also based on the movie itself. It right. has that image that we see that then takes that to its next logical conclusion of let's put it. Let's put a little game here, and, and you can feed it and, and make money off of it. Yeah, I think it's fair to say the Jurassic Park franchise yeah. will go next where the money is, since yeah. that's ultimately what drives it, and that's what killed the back. Comes. Or not being being invaded. Oh no! Thanks, my fiance. Thank my fiance for for that. <laughs> All right. Yeah, Alan has another thing he likes to add to the conversation. He says here, usually but not always, dinosaurs are early props. Sometimes monstrous ones in dinosaur fiction novels and movies. That unless the dinosaur is to be with more human level intellect through science fictional means, or if the dino monster happens to be a dinosaurid or a kaiju, and I have one such reverence of this, the shape-shifting dino kaiju Gargantosaurus from the William Schull novel, Saurian. Hmm. It's, rather, it's a rather obscure story, I know, but it's basically, has, it's an example of a dinosaurid monster that pays homage to Raidosaurus and the Paleosaurus, but it has a special a power, an ability, a shape-shifting ability that's passed on to it from its alien ancestors that crash land on Earth during the Mesozoic <laughs> Era. And there was a cataclysm during the dinosaur age that caused these um, aliens to lose their shape-shifting abilities. Some of them, refusing to give up their dinosaurian physiques, became the monsters and scaly, became the dragons and scaly serpents of legend and folklore. And then from time to time, there'd be mutants with the ability mutants born. That would have the ability to actually shape shift between, you know, man and beast, and there's one of these alive in the present day as a storyline. It has a storyline that's kind of similar to Stephen King's It, but with a kaiju instead of an instead of an extra dimensional evil monster clown. Basically, it's a were dinosaur. <laughs> uh, white wolves want to sue somebody. No, I'm kidding. Um, <laughs> um. That's an interesting story, but when you said Saurian and you're, you're describing, I was thinking this sounds very similar to another series of books I heard about of intelligent Saurian dinosaur creatures that I never got a chance to read here, but I just was enamored by the art because the covers were done by Bob Eagleton. Oh, yes, the um, um, uh, the Bob Sawyer's, uh, Robert Sawyer's uh, trilogy. I think so, yeah, it's a trilogy. I never got into it, but I was just yes. enamored by these reptilian humanoid creatures that look very dinosaurian. They are. And, and that... I cannot get a chance to find the novels again, but I knew someone would know what I was talking about. Sure. Foreigner yeah. is the name. One reason it's hard to find is the first title is Foreigner. <laughs> not really a right. not, not really, obviously, a dinosaurian book. That's a good point. Yeah. Right. Um, right. Goes up now. Um, so, uh, and then there's another... Uh, something where the dinosaur isn't of human quite intellect... Uh, but is a central character it would be Jack Kirby's initial run of uh, Devil Dinosaur. Oh yes, exactly. So, so we've got you know he's, he's a, a Tyrannosaur like dinosaur. It's not really quite certain, 
Uh, but it's in, it's in prehistoric times. Of course, it's prehistoric times when everything lived at the same time. Um, and so he's he is a you know a, a nice character, uh, but he's not um, he's not human level intelligence. Although granted, nothing in his time is of human level intelligence. Even Moon Boy isn't of human level intelligence because he's just an Australopithecus. Right? This, this brings up this brings up uh, something that just came to mind here as we're bringing up all these dinosaur characters and you know dinosaurs, unless they're specifically portrayed with human characteristics. The one thing that's always been kind of to me, I think, a disservice is that. Land Before Time, as an example, is that the protagonists that the audience is rooting for are all the herbivores yes. that are smarter than the carnivores they're trying to evade, which does not make sense in the real world, because by normal, from my from my understanding, as I, again, I'm, you guys can shoot me down on this, is carnivores by by and by a large, are smarter than the herbivores are going after. Not to say the herbivores are dumb by any means, but are on a, but have a little bit more intelligence to their actions and their uh, what they do compared to what a herbivore well, then, uh, does. I'm sure the film Dinosaur then got that part right, considering uh, they uh, you know, portrayed the, their brontosaurus as being very, very dumb. Uh, you know, very dumb. So they got something right there. Yeah, falling into a falling into a quicksand trap. Yep, that's right. That's right. <clears throat> um, but I always kind of find it interesting that, that that's the portrayals, the herbivores that are obviously we're rooting for because you know they're not vicious killers. They're huggable. They're in. They're, they're liked by everyone. Are the smart ones evading the predators, which are the dumb ones. Again, I, I point to Land Before Time, the first one, as a perfect example of that treatment of dinosaurs. And I, I would like to see more novels where we do get an idea, because uh, I, 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 I imagine Raptor Red, and I really loved Raptor Red by uh, Bob Barker right. when that came out in 96. Indeed. 96. Love the book, love the audio tape, listened and read it to the point where the spine broke on mine. Um, but it gave a good example how you can tell a good story with a predatory dinosaur at that level of intelligence without making it very gory or, or selling on the gore too much. Right. So that's a strong a female character. Good point. Strong female character. Screenwriter, screenwriters can't write from any other point of view than a human point of view. I mean, it's like we, we, we tend to anthropomorphize everything because it's the easiest way for us to make our point. Um, because every film, well, not every film, but but you know, in some stories are metaphors, and right. and you know, whether it's a, whether it's a you know a guy in a cowboy hat or a, or a, you know wh- whatever the protagonist is, even down to uh, say like uh, oh, baby. There's, there's always some anthropomorphic anthropomorphization of, uh, of these characters because it's the only way that, that uh, audiences will get the point. Well, I think that's less of a scriptwriter problem or a screenwriter problem than it is kind of a human thing that we've done for centuries. We we have to consider the because ancient cultures, ancient religions, all the gods are humanized that are explanations for all these phenomena here. I don't think it's necessarily a, a screenwriter issue. It's a throwback from our culture on how we try to rationalize the earth around us. You're right. It goes back through ages. I mean, not all of us are, are, are David Attenborough or even Richard Attenborough. Right. Um, we can't be that know, looking at it as a view, it's, it's uh, I mean, producers dumb it down for the audience because because that's, again, it's it's butts and seats and, and dollars in pockets. It's, yes. It's the almighty cha-ching, I know. Do you guys know the West of Eden trilogy by Harry Harrison? Yes. yes I, uh, I love Dinos- that novel series. The only place he really screwed up, he had them descended from Moses somewhere. Which right. didn't make a lot yes. of sense. But other than that, it was very well done. Okay. All right. Would you guys like to start discussing dinosaurs and their portrayal in video games? I would. Uh, I, I think it would follow similar to kind of what we've gone over so far because 
let's take, for example, jump off from Jurassic Park and how they were portrayed before to how they were portrayed after. Let's to, to give a comparison. We've got. Oh, I'm trying to think of a good pre Jurassic Park dinosaur video game, and I cannot think of one because I don't think video games were that had very many dinosaur had the potential for showing dinosaur graphics um, until we get to the mid '90s here. Right. Um, but right. Everything after Jurassic Park featured Jurassic Park portrayed dinosaurs. Yes. Uh, Dino Hunter. Dino Hunter 1, 2, uh, 3 got a little bit crazy with some of the zombie plague stuff. I can't remember. Um, but they're being portrayed more as what Jurassic Park portrayed them because that's what the public's going to latch onto. Uh, Torok also <coughs> did this. Uh-huh. Um, which I think oh, was yes. in 95? Yeah, 1995 and 64. I remember. <laughs> right. So that's kind of the same thing happening where there because because what's being portrayed in, in you know pop culture as far as images stills art movies is still being replicated in games where the dinosaurs are featured are basically just like their Jurassic Park counterparts from all of my experience on all the dinosaur games that I played <laughs> including the Jurassic Parks one of my personal favorite dinosaur games is without question Dino Crisis Dino Crisis is such an awesome game same here. I've loved the Dino Crisis games since I first since I since I first acquired them on PlayStation many years ago. And I think they could make for some potentially good movies if they adapt it right. I mean, the, the first Dino Crisis game is a lot like the original Resident Evil. It's made by the same developer and the same studio, Capcom. The second game would be more like, say, the movie Aliens, more action oriented. The dinosaurs there are definitely inspired a lot of ways by Jurassic Park. But with a major twist in having a super exaggerated Giganotosaurus as the final boss. And in Perta- scene Perta- in Jurassic Park 3, there's a part in the game where it confronts the T-Rex in Dark Crisis 2. And easily kills it without even breaking a sweat. And shrugs off all but a or- satellite-mounted laser cannon in the end. <laughs> um, I will ask, because in Perta- to Jurassic Park and dinosaurs in video games here... Um, Tom and Tom, I will ask your opinion right. on this. You guys have seen this. If you guys haven't, I'm not going to ask, expect you guys to do, a, do anything on this. Um, I don't know if you guys have seen any of the game trailers for the Lost World Jurassic Park for the PlayStation system back when uh, back in 97 when it came out here. But I was wondering yeah. if you guys have seen that or maybe played it at cursory yeah. glance or anything like that, if the movements of the dinosaurs, particularly the Compsognathus, the Velociraptor, and Tyrannosaurus were more similar to what they would probably move more like in real life, or it's still exaggeration of, of how they're portrayed in the movie and done for the video game for simplicity of the actual game system. I don't know if you guys have an answer for that. I thought I would ask that just to pick your guys' brains on that, if you guys have uh, thoughts on that or have experienced that. Sadly, I haven't I haven't seen the video game, so I can't really speak to it. I, I can, but I'm going to have to say that it's been quite a while since I looked at it, so... You're asking something with a finer level of detail, but my recollection was that the movements were good. You know, they were paying attention to Jurassic Park, because you're right, that's probably, I mean, I don't know that, but that's probably where they were getting uh, their ideas for the movements. But I'm afraid I'm, I'm going to run out of expertise beyond that because it's been quite a while. <laughs> that that's fine. I thought I would I thought I would pick your guys' brains on that if you guys had any input or information on that to, to well, add. Well, I am noticing in some of the more newer dinosaur games coming up, they are going towards more scientifically accurate portrayals of the dinosaur done in prehistoric fauna, for example. Especially the recently, especially the recent zoo simulator Prehistoric Kingdom, which that game I feel could be the best representation of uh, prehistoric uh, dinosaurs and prehistoric fauna in terms of scientific accuracy in a game to date so far. Um. Uh, Dr. Holtz, aren't you, or weren't you referenced or no. reached out to as a creative consultant on the new Saurian that's been worked on here for the last five, six years? Yeah, yeah, so I've helped out a bit on Saurian, um, and obviously that's one of the ones that's been, you know, heavily, heavily researched in terms of the, uh, uh, the, the dinosaurs and the fauna, and for that matter, the flora, um, in the game. So, um, and what if because they've picked a particular spot in, in time and place. Um, they've gone uh, far beyond just the Jurassic Park dinosaurs, since it's uh, 
Um, it is the Hell Creek, and so they've got plenty of features that haven't shown up in a Jurassic Park movie, at least not yet. Um, so that, that's very nice to see, is something like that. Um, and also it not being, you know, a first-person shooter or a combat game or anything of that nature, you know, uh, it's a survival game, so it, it incorporates elements in it that go beyond what a lot of the typical games that feature dinosaurs in them would have. Um, so that's kind of nice to see something as well, you know, not, where, where the entire point of having a dinosaur on screen is to shoot it up, you know, that, that gets old, so... Yes, it can get old. It can get old quite fast. I mean, dinosaurs have been one of the most commonly used enemies in video games for quite a long time. Trust me. <laughs> right. Uh, well, one of, one of my other personal favorite games is Carnivores. So, anybody, anybody here heard of that one? I played it when it was on Windows 95, and I've got an emulator on my phone for it, so it exists still. Yeah, I've, I played it on my computer as well when it first came out, both Carnivores, Carnivores 2, and Carnivores Ice Age. The premise, of these, the, premise, the premise of these games has a corporation exploring this un, uh, exploring this new planet that they discovered. It's remarkably similar to Earth. They think about they're thinking about colonizing, but when they do when they start doing surveys on this planet, they discover that there are dinosaurs living on this planet and other prehistoric animals, and they determine it to be too dangerous for a colonization. But they get the idea to start a company called Dino Hunt, and for if you have the right money, you can actually book safaris to this planet to hunt dinosaurs of your choice, ranging from Parasaurolophus to, the, of course, the mighty Tyrannosaurus Rex. Mm. The T-Rex has only one weakness. You have to shoot it in the eye to kill it. Ah, uh, smaller than they are in real life, but they're not as big as their real-life counterparts. And some of them are actually grossly exaggerated. Tyrannosaurus <laughs> is, like, Tyrannosaurus is a lot larger in the game than it was in real life. Allosaurus uh. is smaller than it was in real life. For example, and the T-Rex as well. Some of them can go from, like, size, in regular size, to, well, grossly exaggerated from some of the ones I've shot, personally. <laughs> <laughs> because of uh, insulin dwarfism, because a lot of the places that you hunt on are islands. I think that's the reason why they're so small. Um, so, so I'll, I'll, I'll pose this question, just because it's we're on the topic of video games. Do you, do you gentlemen... Uh, Tom, Tom, Jeff, everyone here in the, in the chat here. Um, do you guys think that video games and the portrayal of dinosaurs games, especially in some of the new upcoming scientifically accurate ones like Saurian, uh, Predatory Beasts, etc., are going to be more influential than maybe the Jurassic Park series will be in persuading or giving more, more scientifically accurate dinosaur constructions, movements, actions, and appearances to the public? than the Jurassic Park uh, series will at this point? I, for me, anyway, I do believe the answer will be quite yes, especially if games like Prehistoric Kingdom and Mesozoica sell well, if, if that's the case. But I think Prehistoric Kingdom will have the best shot at making scientifically accurate animals well more mainstream than seeing more Jurassic Park clones and uh, whatnot. I, I think it really all depends on the game you're talking about. I mean, some games, yes, I think could potentially do that, but other games I think are probably just going to be more copies of Jurassic Park. It... Well, one thing to bear in mind is what I mentioned a while ago for movies, and that is story and yeah. uh, protagonists, heroes, heroines, even love. That doesn't generally enter into games much at all, but um, and, and I'm not saying that that's what everybody needs to do. What I'm saying is Without those elements, those human elements, um, you, you fall back on things like, do people in general care if it's a dinosaur or a space alien that's got eight arms? Um, and you might find that there's a, you've got a, a long row to hoe, you know, and what I'm saying is in terms of popularity. So um, <clears throat> if... Uh, young up and coming you know eight year old wants to get their uh game and start playing it they might go with the eight-armed alien why not you see what i'm getting at and so then the accurate depictions of dinosaurs for those of us who love dinosaurs it's like duh of course we want to see them as accurate as possible but in terms of popularity so that's the thing that's scary 
in terms of the game being popular because the depictions are so realistic I kind of you know it's like my heart goes out to everybody who wants dinosaurs to be popular in games but uh, I, I think there's a problem there that, that all the massive the unwashed masses may not care <laughs> Yeah, I feel the same way. I mean, so I'm, I'm coming from, from strictly from a film point of view. I mean, I'm, I'm sort of the outsider here anyways. Um, and, and, and really, yeah, it boils down to, uh, to the public opinion. Something about boiling down to public opinion here. Yeah. We lost it. <laughs> yeah. Well, what I'll if keep... he's still with us and, and just frozen in time? Or if we've <laughs> Uh, uh, Chris? Time and space. Yeah. Is yeah. Chris? Are you even still? Are you still with us? Yeah, I'm still here. Uh, would you like to maybe talk about this topic here about dinosaur video games and how they might be able to sway public perception? Well, I would say based on all the pictures that I've seen, all the graphics that I've seen, is that they are trying to make them as accurate as possible. Now, would that be an indication that would that change the perception of people, change people's perception about dinosaurs in general? Maybe yes, but then it's just like, do you have all these uh, people, what I call fanboys, uh, just say, well, I don't like these dinosaurs this way because they're not the dinosaurs I grew up with? Then, yes, there is going to be the people that are going to say I still like my dinosaurs to be more like reptiles instead of more like birds whereas to me is that if you pay attention to the science you should actually be a little bit more open minded about like yeah these animals, the theropods in general are more like birds but then once you actually have like the, the popular perception uh, into it, I would say at some point, yes, they are going to accept it. Uh, and would it transfer to filmmaking? Maybe, maybe not. It would actually all depend on if the filmmakers are going to be able to actually put feathers on dinosaurs. But, uh, I mean, there is one film in particular that, or a, a film and a TV show that did actually have dinosaurs with feathers on them I mean like Dinosaur Island that that actually was a movie that had feathered dinosaurs but people actually did not like uh, the color scheme of those dinosaurs and whereas a TV show like Terra Nova uh, they actually put feathers on their dinosaurs but uh, it was but some of these dinosaurs were kind of like kaiju in a way like it was a mixture of of like different dinosaurs uh just kind of combined but uh, I would say with video game perspective if it's going to change perspective of of people think of dinosaurs in general I'd say it is going to change I am on the side that it is that people are going to uh, like the dinosaurs that are going to be like birds in a way mm -hmm. now there is going to be that that portion of the population that is gonna say I still like my dinosaurs the old school way, you know, but that's just my yeah, perception. Yeah. Uh, I, I mean, I'm, I'm one of those. I mean, I, I, I prefer Ray Harry has a dinosaur. Um, but, <laughs> yeah. you know, but still, all I mean, do, in a way. But, yeah. but still, you know, but, but, you know, it's, that's more, that's more, uh, you know, because the storylines are more adventurous and, 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 you know, but we've moved into a whole area where, I mean, it's the new neorealism. It's, it's everything has to be ultra real, whereas, whereas for decades we film was was escape and nothing more. Um, and, and and you went to a documentary or a newsreel for something that that told you what the real world was. And, Dinosaurs should be treated as real animals. That's that I agree with that completely. Exactly. It's exactly what yeah, um, I think. But still, I mean, I, I don't mind a tail dragger. Or I'll, I'll watch the Lost Continent. 
or uh, or a dinosaurus or you know or uh, or even uh, the land unknown you know <laughs> <laughs> you know, you know, know. Uh, <laughs> I get more enjoyment out of those than I do Jurassic Park because again because I, I, I feel the characters are so flat and, and that's that's a big problem storytelling has lost an edge um and as Ray Harryhausen said, if you don't want to make the fantasy too real, because once it is too real, it becomes mundane. Because we live in the real world, so yeah. I don't mind going to the theater and, and, and having some mm. escape. I I agree with that point very much, Lee Jeff. Yeah, yeah, I I, I can understand that. I said I have a mixture oh. of dinosaur movies that have more accurate ones, like Jurassic Park and so forth, and some of my favorites are classics, including all of Harryhausen's films including the original 1925 Lost World that Willis O'Brien animated. Mm-hmm. I, you know, I, yeah. and I can think of a personal story from Carnosaur when, um, because we all knew Jurassic Park was coming up and we knew the realism of the dinosaurs because I, I had lots of friends who were working on it, so I knew through the grapevine and through personal uh, contact that what we were going to see was going to be way beyond what we'd ever seen. But as when I get hired on a Carnosaur, I'm excited. I grab it. My John Beekler says, get all your dinosaur reference and bring it in tomorrow. So I brought in a stack of books, Robert Backer's books, and uh-huh. you know, every bit of scientific reference that we could, I could find and brought it in. And what did I see was, was a man, um, a dummy of a man, was Kane Hodder, actually. Uh-huh. 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 Do, we, do we lose Jeff? I think he's hung, think he's hung up again. Okay. Cut out in the middle of the story. Not cool. <laughs> <laughs> oh, well. We'll all let him continue when we bring him back. So, uh, sure. Anyhow, I think we've covered the video game topic well enough, I do believe. You want to switch over to something else, perhaps? Like, say, comics? Uh, comics. Sure. I, was, comics. I, I, think, sure. I think the first Dinosaur comic we should probably discuss would be uh, Mark Schultz's seminal classic, Xenozoic Tales. Just personally speaking, I've never read Xenozoic Tales, but just the premise of it alone makes me want to pick it up and read it. Just think yeah. Jurassic Park meets Mad Max. Right. <laughs> if, if you're if, if for, for anyone listening who's not familiar with it, if you remember the show Cadillacs and Dinosaurs, which right. I did make an, a tabletop RPG of, which is actually hilarious, uh, that's basically what that show is based off of, the Xenozoic Tales. And I've read a good portion of it, but at the same time, it was on uh, my computer too.